Hi guys, so this, uh, this lecture that I'm recording for you guys is called Blood Pressure Regulation and it's the last part of the cardiovascular lecture series. So I know you guys have probably been practicing already on how to take a blood pressure uh, reading. Uh, so you're taking the sigma manometer and you take that blood pressure cuff and of course when you're inflating it, you're cutting off arterial blood supply. Uh, to the, particularly the brachial artery, right? You can see that over here, all right? And now, uh, as you release the pressure, you're listening for sounds, right? These sounds are often referred to as Korakoff sounds, which you can see down here, all right? These Korakoff sounds. There's a series of them, and in general, when you hear that first sort of knocking sound, all right, that's the systolic blood pressure. And then when you, uh, you that last sound you hear is actually going to be the uh, diastolic uh, blood pressure. Another way you can do this is actually by palpating the radial artery, and as you inflate the cuff, uh, when you feel the pulse uh, disappear, all right, that can give you an idea of where the systolic blood pressure is. All right. Uh, now, just kind of a, a quick tip for you guys: uh, it's it can be a little bit uh, difficult at first to kind of figure out, you know, where to listen and how to listen and how hard to press and whatnot. Uh, so. Just a couple of quick tips with the stethoscope. The first thing you want to do is you, you don't want to you don't want to push too hard uh, on the antecubital fossa, which is you know this region right over here. You don't want to push too hard because if you push too hard, you could actually compress the artery with the stethoscope itself, and that's a habit that sometimes people have when they can't hear something, uh, so they tend to push a little bit harder, and it's not going to help. A lot of times, it's really just more about adjusting where you're listening. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, they don't have to listen so laterally. So, for example, here's my arm, all right, and this is my antecubital fossa, all right. And so, what you can tell people, all right, is uh, if they if they tell them to bend their arm about 90 degrees and just to make a little muscle there, and what you can feel is the biceps tendon. So you can do that yourself. You can feel for your biceps tendon, and when you feel that biceps tendon there, go slightly medial to that, so medial, right, towards the body. And when you go medial to that, then you can press, you can actually feel your brachial pulse there. So that might actually help you uh, to kind of figure out where to put the stethoscope so that you can better hear the sounds because that's what you're actually listening for. So you guys can try that, let me know how that goes. Okay, so now uh, neural control. All right, we're talking about a couple things. First off, there's in the brain, there's something we call a vasomotor center. So that's actually in the medulla, the medulla oblongata, all right? And it's sort of tonically active in normal, healthy adults, all right, where it exerts basically sympathetic outflow. And that outflow, again, is always active. And so if you guys remember with sympathetic output, what's actually occurring is it's causing some constriction of the blood vessels tonically. All right, now that's important because it helps to maintain blood pressure by increasing some tone that's actually there in the vessels. And by having a little bit of tone, that means we can also go, you know, we can either relax or we can make it, uh, you know, more constricted. And so it helps us kind of have a middle ground to move either direction. Uh, so in this vasomotor center, we have the presser area, uh, which stimulates the vessels to constrict. And then you have the depressor area, which is going to cause it to dilate. So remember, if you constrict, that's going to increase the blood pressure by reducing the diameter of the vessel. Uh, the depressor area is going to dilate, so it's going to cause smooth muscle relaxation. And just so you guys recall, uh, when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, it's the sympathetic nerves that actually are responsible uh, for constriction or dilation. There is no, there really is no parasympathetic uh, innervation. There's one exception which we can talk about at another point you know, uh, during the semester. But uh, what it comes down to is that it really only has what we call alpha and beta receptors, which are adrenergic receptors. And so usually it's either an increase in sympathetic stimulation will cause constriction and a decrease in the sympathetic stimulation would cause relaxation. So the vasomotor center, all right, really has these three autonomic responses um, or reflexes that occur. And so I've listed them down at the bottom of the slide there, one, two, and three. So the first one is barrel receptors uh, or barrel reflexes. The second one is chemo reflexes. And then the third one is the medullary ischemic reflex. So let me take you through that. This is actually a cartoon from your notes. And so in this cartoon, what it shows you is uh, the vasomotor center, which you can see up here, all right, the vasomotor center. So here's the vasomotor center. Now, 
this is tonically firing. So here's the presser area. Now, if you guys recall, the presser area here, that's always on. So it's always sending out output. So that's why it says underneath the tonic activity. So that is actually going to be keeping those blood vessels uh, um, toned. All right. Now, uh, you also have the cardio inhibitory area, which we'll talk about in just a second. So first off, here's the depressor area. All right. And then that was the presser area. Now, these are always firing. And so when they fire, the output goes to the heart, right? So it increases its heart rate, increases its contractility, thus increasing uh, cardiac output and blood pressure. And then you also have to the vessels, it can cause vasoconstriction because many of them can uh, have alpha receptors. And then venoconstriction, which would cause the veins to squeeze. And if you guys recall, the veins are very compliant. They can hold a lot, about two thirds of our total blood volume at any given time. And so when they compress, they can actually squeeze the blood back into the um, back towards the heart, I should say, which would increase our venous return. Now over here, so let's see if we can put this up for you guys here. So this would be the carotid areas here. All right. And that's where the baroreceptors in the carotids will be located. And then over here would be where they're located in the aortic arch. And so you'll see that they're connected to their uh, cranial nerves, 9 and 10. Now, 9, again, is from the carotids, 10 from the aortic arch. And when it gives its signal, so remember, these are tonically firing, so there's a, a sort of low-level inhibition going on with these guys. They're still firing at a, at a given rate, but it's a little bit uh, inhibited. However, when they become active, say there's too much pressure, that's going to excite this depressor area more, and that's going to suppress the activity in the presser area, thus lowering blood pressure by decreasing heart rate and contractility and also causing vasodilation. At the same time, when it's sending signals to the depressor area, it's also going to be sending signals over here to the vagal area of the brain called the cardio inhibitory, which is, again, still in the medulla. And what that does is that increases output to the, front, to the vagus nerve, which decreases the heart rate and can also decrease contractility of the heart. Okay, so we're releasing sympathetic uh, input and we're increasing uh, parasympathetic input. And ultimately, the, that's going to lead us to a decrease in our blood pressure. And of course, of course, the opposite is true too. If the blood pressure were to decrease, then that would decrease the firing. That would decrease the firing of our cranial nerves to the vasomotor center. That would decrease some of that low-level inhibition that's going on. And that would increase the output from the presser area, thus increasing heart rate contractility and vasoconstriction. This is really essentially saying the same thing that I've already told you. Uh, it's just putting it in a sort of chart form, a little flow uh, chart, so it's, it's easier for you guys to kind of uh, visualize, I guess. Uh, where you have here, you know, if it's a, an elevation in blood pressure, so those baroreceptors are firing, it's going to stretch the arteries. All right, so that stretch causes baroreceptor firing, cardio inhibitory neurons are stimulated, which is going to increase that vagal tone, so the vagus nerve will fire. The vasomotor center will become more inhibited and then reduce your sympathetic output. The chemo reflex. So we're going to talk more about this in depth when it comes to the respiratory system. However, a couple of important uh, key things with this is that it's located in the same area as, as the uh, baroreceptors. So these chemoreceptors are located in the carotid arteries as well as the aortic arch. And one of their jobs is to uh, sense an increase essentially in, in, in compounds such as CO2. All right, so elevated CO2 levels, decreased oxygen, uh, elevated or excuse me, decreased pH. A lot of this really is just representing increased metabolic activity of the tissue, right? Because increasing metabolic activity of the tissue would cause a decrease in the pH due to buildup of acids like lactic acid, for example. Uh, it would also build up CO2 because that's a byproduct of metabolism and it would use up a lot of the oxygen that's there so it would become hypoxic. So those three factors can trigger these chemoreceptors to increase their rate of firing. Now a couple key points here is that in local tissue regulation those buildup of mediators actually cause vasodilation and that vasodilation acts to um, increase flow to a given organ that needs uh, more oxygen, more nutrients, and so on, and to wash out things like CO2. When it comes to these chemoreceptors, though, that are located in the carotids and the aortic arch, it's a little bit different. 
these are not really moment-to-moment uh, -moment regulators of blood pressure like the baroreceptors are. They're less important in healthy adults overall. However, when it comes to, say, uh, a severe drop in blood pressure, something like less than 80 millimeters of mercury, okay, that what, what happens is since that cardiac output is so low, it causes these chemoreceptors to become hypoxic, and so they'll increase their firing rate. And that signals the medullary centers of the brain to then increase sympathetic activity, causing widespread uh, total peripheral resistance to increase, so constriction, as well as an increase in heart rate and contractility. But it'll cause vasodilation of the coronary arteries, since the heart is going to need a large supply and an increase in flow. But this is really more of a rescue thing than it is a moment-to-moment -moment regulation thing. Because what's going to happen now is if your blood pressure is that low, all right, you're, you're not, where there's not enough pressure to sort of perfuse the most important organs of your body, like the heart and the brain, it's going to constrict everywhere else and shunt blood to those organs. So this way your brain and your blood will get, uh, so your brain and your heart will get the perfusion that is required. Okay, so this is sort of more of like a built-in safety uh, with uh, a more pronounced activity when the pressures are um, lowered more greatly. And so here, that's what you see here. Is it just, it's more primarily a respiratory thing. So that's more of a moment to moment for respiration, which we'll get into later. Um, but as sort of this vaso uh, reflexes, it does cause vasoconstriction, which I have here in bold. That'll increase blood pressure, increases lung perfusion uh, and gas exchange. So we can get more oxygen and increases flow to the brain and to the heart. Um, Okay, so the medullary ischemic reflexes, which is the third part of this, uh, this is again, this is more of a, a built-in safety. What this is telling you, is, what this is really all about is that the medullary centers in the brain, all right, have chemoreceptors, and those chemoreceptors uh, are very, very sensitive to hypoxia or ischemia. And since the brain is such a vital organ to the body, uh, it has built into it that if it becomes hypoxic, it will increase output from the vasomotor centers. So it increases sympathetic activity. Uh, and that'll increase signals to the heart by increasing heart rate and contractility. It'll increase um, signals to the blood vessels causing constriction to raising the total peripheral resistance. Uh, so, so you see down here my, my bottom three uh, bullet points. There's an increase in heart rate and contract contraction force, excuse me. Widespread vasoconstriction, raise that blood pressure, perfuse the brain a little bit better. This is again, this is something you might see in somebody who is very, very sick, uh, where they, the brain is, has a very low perfusion uh, and it's becoming hypoxic. And so what happens is you get very, very high pressures to shunt blood to the brain to essentially rescue it and give it the pressures that is needed. And sometimes the pressures peripherally, if you were to take somebody's arterial blood pressure, could be very, very, very high. Okay, so circulatory shock. Uh, by definition, this really just means the cardiac output doesn't meet the demands uh, or the metabolic demands of the body. So it's a supply and demand issue. Uh, this is ultimately where the perfusing pressures, like our mean arterial pressure of around 93, right, if our blood pressure is 120 over 80, uh, that's a perfusion pressure that's adequate to meet the needs of the body, okay? If blood pressures were to drop, there is a range with which the body will still get what it's need, what it's what it needs. So, for example, if you're at you know around 90 millimeters of mercury is your mean arterial pressure, and you're within a good range, so there's a range here. If it goes below that, say to maybe 80, that's still enough. 70 could still even be enough to perfuse the organs of your body. But once you start falling to like 65 or 60, for example the perfusion pressures become less and less and it, uh, you're reducing your ability uh, to have good blood flow to those organs. So that's actually, if you guys recall this formula, right? Here's flow is equal to the change in pressure over the resistance. So what you're doing is this right here, your perfusion pressure, your blood pressure, right? Is dropping and so flow is going to decrease because of that. So we have a, a drop in our blood flow because we have a drop in our, our pressures here. So just to be sure we're clear here. All right, so that's a, whoop. Still working out the kinks of this here. 
So there's a, a drop in the blood pressure. All right. Now, that's ultimately um, going to result in ischemia of organs and death of tissue if it's severe enough or prolonged enough. And the reality is, though, we can actually have some types of shock that we face, uh, maybe some of us on a daily basis and sometimes once in a while. Uh, as an example, uh, exercising a lot and not rehydrating very well can actually cause a hypovolemic type shock, which is here my bullet point number one. All right. Uh, you could also have, um, or if, say you donate blood. All right. So if you donate blood, you could be losing, uh, you know, a certain volume. So again, it's like a hypovolemic type of shock to the uh, to the body. But it's not a decompensating type shock. We compensate for it because we have a healthy, intact uh, system. So the way in this case, if your pressures were to drop because of a loss of volume and you had a decrease in your blood flow, uh, the reason we don't go ischemic with you know just giving blood uh, or sweating is because down here, the resistance would come up all right, to kind of match and that would offset the drop and in, uh, in the flow and so that can actually help compensate and so the way we'd increase the resistance is increasing sympathetic tone and cause vasoconstriction so here's some forms of shock over here all right we have hypovolemic which you see at the top bullet 1.1 and then you have and of course there's a multitude of things that can cause that so severe dehydration uh burns can do it because as you lose the skin barrier uh you lose the ability to you know retain and hold on to some of that that fluid so it's fluid loss uh, hemorrhage, again, severe traumas. Cardiogenic, um, cardiogenic would be a failure of the pump, right? The heart's not pumping adequately, right? And so if I have a failure in the pump, if, uh, let's see, I'll put it here. If I have a failure in the pump, what I'm going to have is a decrease in my cardiac output, right? Because uh, it's not really going to squeeze, so I can't get a good uh, stroke volume. The heart rate might not go up adequately either. And so if I have a decrease in my cardiac output, that can lead to a decrease in my arterial blood pressure, right? Uh, and that can make me uh, obviously hypotensive, where I'm going to lose that perfusion pressure. Obstructive. When it comes to obstructive, like a pulmonary embolus, that's what the PE stands for here, pulmonary embolus. So that would be a clot, all right, that maybe got wedged into the uh, circulatory system. And then you have cardiac tamponade. And so if you're not familiar with that, all right, there's a pericardium that surrounds the heart and encases the heart. And then you have a, a layer of fluid that's actually in there. We talked about this on our first cardio lecture. And what can happen is either trauma to the heart, blood leaks out of the heart into that space, or it's pus or something else, all right, a tumor or something of that nature, can cause increases in fluid in that area. And what happens is since it's an encased and enclosed area, that increase in fluid uh, ultimately can compress the heart and it makes it hard for the heart to move blood through. So uh, that kind of has um, the effect of reducing venous return because as it compresses the heart, it increases the pressure in the heart. If the pressure goes high in the heart, remember the venous system is not a very high pressure system. It doesn't effectively move blood into the heart if the pressures in the heart are too high. So what you end up having is, um, Excuse me a second. We have a decrease in venous return, okay, because of the high pressures in the heart, or because we have a clot that's blocking the veins themselves from being able to move blood. Uh, and a decrease in venous return is going to decrease stroke volume. Ultimately, that's going to lead to a decrease in cardiac output. And as you can see, we go from there. Decrease in cardiac output is going to lead to a decrease in arterial blood pressure. The last one here is vasogenic. So vasogenic, we're really talking about the vessels. So on this next slide, what we have is the types of vasogenic. So they're, they're quite diverse. You have the neurogenic shock. So there's a loss of vasomotor tone. So remember, there's always that tone, right? So it, and uh, that can cause widespread vasodilation. So if you recall just from this lecture, what I just spoke about before, was that in the vasopressor area, you have tonic tone. And what that does is it makes sure that there is some constriction of that of those blood vessels to maintain some blood pressure at all times. Now remember, those inputs in order to go to the blood vessels are going to travel from the medulla in the brainstem, travel down into the spinal cord. And if you recall, this is sympathetically driven. 
and the sympathetic neurons are located in the thoracolumbar lumbar region, T1 to L2 or L3. And so it's going to have to send neurons down, or signals from neurons down through into the spinal cord all the way to the thoracic region, to like the T1 uh, to T5 areas, let's say. And then that output, or excuse me, I should say T1 to L3, excuse me. And that output then will go through the uh, preganglionic and postganglionics all the way to the um, vessels themselves, right? And so that way we can keep our tone. Now imagine for a second that if somebody were in, say, a car accident and they had damaged the connection of their spinal cord to their brainstem, okay? So maybe some cervical damage. What can happen now is that input that comes from the brainstem down to the uh, excuse me, down to the sympathetics in the uh, T1 to L3 region might be cut off. And so it's no longer getting the tonic signal there. So what ends up happening is that they lose their tonic, their activation signal. And so that releases the sympathetic tone from the blood vessels. And so then the blood vessels will dilate. And so if they dilate in response to that, we lose our blood pressure, right? Because our total peripheral resistance will go down. This is also referred to as spinal shock, which I have in parentheses there. Septic shock. Septic shock is, again, this is like a bacterial toxin that can trigger uh, vasodilation. So these toxins get into the bloodstream uh, and cause massive vasodilation. Uh, and can also increase capillary permeability. So the person could also become edematous as well. Uh, anaphylactic shock follows a very similar pattern with slightly different uh, instigating factors. So this is a severe immune reaction to uh, an antigen. So histamine is released. Uh, and again, this is gonna cause vasodilation and increases perme uh, increased capillary permeability. And traumatic shock, the last one on the, on the list there, this is really some severe trauma where there's so much damage done and inflammation that has occurred that things like cytokines and histamines and stuff that have been released in response to all this inflammatory reaction can cause uh, vasodilation, like widespread vasodilation, if it's severe enough, okay? So the, the key here with all of this is really the fact that um, you have a decrease in your total peripheral resistance, right? So the decrease in the total peripheral resistance results in a decrease, all right, in your arterial blood pressure. So because the commonality with this is, again, this is um, a reduction in your arterial blood pressure secondary to vasodilation. Okay, so all of them have the similarity in that there's a reduction in blood pressure and a reduction in your, your perfusion pressure to the organ, which causes the organs to suffer. It's just they slightly vary in, in how they affect the blood pressure. All right. So if you think now, if we take this back and think about this clinically, what does this mean for us, uh, you know, in terms of uh, their presentation, right? So just to go over some signs and symptoms, if their heart is still intact and there's some other cause for this uh, drop in blood pressure, you'd expect one of the compensations to increase blood pressure would be to increase the heart rate. So a lot of times they'll have an elevated heart rate, like for example, on hypovolemic shock, someone who's hemorrhaging, their heart rate would probably increase uh, to compensate and offset that. Uh, their you know, total peripheral resistance might go up as well. If the total peripheral resistance goes up, they might be, look uh, pale. So as you see over here, right? So they're pale, something like if someone's hypovolemic, their arteries will clamp down in order to increase pressure. Right? You also venoconstrict in order to move, mobilize more blood from the veins towards the heart to also increase your venous return and increase your cardiac output. On the other hand, they could also look flushed, which is kind of like a reddish coloration that they're going to have. Uh, and that could actually be seen in more of a vasogenic type where they're vasodilating. So even though the sympathetics might be operating and trying to constrict, the mediators like histamine and so on are, and cytokines are preventing that from occurring. Uh, and so they, you know, say somebody who's an anaphylactic shock, for example, that might be more difficult. And so they could be look more flushed or more reddish. And uh, they could also look over here sweaty. And if you guys recall, the sweat, the sweatiness is really a result of um, increased sympathetic activity. And most of this is going to cause an increase in metabolic activity as well. And sweat helps us to regulate body heat because a lot of heat is generated with an increase in our metabolism. So they would sweat as well to help regulate their body temperature. 
as, as well as because they probably have an increase in sympathetic outflow trying to compensate fevers. Uh, they can have fevers. Um, and again, fevers don't mean necessarily that they have an infection, but more that they're inflamed. So it could be a sign of inflammation. Cytokines and things like that can trigger a fever. Weak, they're, you know, if the organs aren't getting perfused well, the muscles, for example, which have very high demand, if they're not meeting the, uh, getting the, their demand, you overall see weakness, right? Uh, decreased arterial blood pressure, it goes without saying by definition. Low urine output. So here's a, a, another type of compensation. Ultimately, the kidneys chronically have the say in, in modulating blood pressure, okay? We have neural responses and hormone responses to help modulate, especially moment to moment, or even of course of like a couple of hours. But the kidneys are the ones that from hours to days, weeks, months, and so on, are the ones that make sure that it's maintained in the long run. So one of the things the kidneys do is to conserve fluid, right? To, re to, to not release too much fluid because if we're low in blood pressure, I'm gonna have to retain water, maybe sodium, in order to plump up those vessels and not lose more volume. Uh, and then altered mental state. Again, uh, poor perfusion to the brain could result in uh, an altered mental state. And so uh, that could just be a sign of um, poor perfusion. So like I was saying, it, it could be compensated or decompensated. So if it's compensated, which is, you know, something we would expect Experience, or I should say something that goes on sort of daily depending on our, our lifestyle um, where we go back to fully normal functioning because we have built-in mechanisms to compensate for any kind of volume loss and changes in our blood pressure. So if you look under compensation we have redistribution of, of blood flow to vital organs and this is sort of important to understand the hierarchy our body has when it comes to compensation that the brain and the heart are really sort of considered the most vital, uh, you know, as well as the lungs, and, and everything else kind of secondary to that. And I, I mean that in, in the sense that uh, it's it's the hierarchy of an acute situation. So the body, if, if it's chronic, will manage to conserve everything, right? Because we need everything. But in an acute situation, it's going to uh, try to save the brain and the heart. And so what it'll do is it'll, you know, for example, constrict blood flow to the skin. So a person becomes, let's say, pale, and then shunt flow to, say, the heart uh, and the brain. Uh, reduced venous capacity, and the second one there, uh, venoconstrict. So that's what that means. It's going to constrict. So if you remember, the veins have high capacity to hold onto a large volume of blood. And so what this is going to do is it's going to constrict, squeeze that volume of blood, and move it forward towards the heart again to increase venous return. Okay. Cardiac stimulation, again, if it's not cardiogenic shock, uh, it might be able to be stimulated to increase its contractility and heart rate and so on. Uh, auto transfusion, we talked about that. That was, I think, uh, maybe our second lecture ever. We talked about capillary exchange, right? Hydrostatic pressure uh, versus the oncotic pressures. We talked about how hemorrhage or volume loss can lead to what we call auto transfusion or the ability to reabsorb more volume. Uh, because we can increase, we have a decrease in hydrostatic pressure and it would uh, cause, you know, the oncotic pressure to have more of an impact. The kidneys finally at the end here would conserve volume, which is ultimately how we maintain it in the long run. And if you look over here at the, the graph to the right, you can see here, this is our normal pressure. Or I'll say that's our normal arterial blood pressure. If it were to decrease for whatever given reason, uh, if we're still in the comp uh, if we're still able to compensate that dotted line here, it would uh, it would bring us back to our normal working level, right? On the other hand, in decompensated, we instead we follow this trajectory downward, all right? And this is basically the um, a cycle in which the heart uh, is unable to sort of make up for the difference here. We can't we can't increase the blood pressure back to normal. And we end up going through a very vicious cycle of what we call decompensation. So this is going to be worsening perfusion pressure. So you can imagine that they're already poorly perfused, so local organs will vasodilate to increase flow to themselves, right? Now the heart is going to have to work harder if the heart rate goes up. And as the heart rate goes up, it's trying to increase its venous return and increase its cardiac output to meet the demands of the body. But if it's unable to meet those demands, right, 
it's going to have to work harder. So it's going to bring the heart rate up even higher. And what happens is the heart's own demand will actually start to go up. And if the heart's demand goes up, it requires its own supply of blood. And if it's not able to match its own demand, as that goes up, the heart can start to suffer. It can become ischemic. Somebody could have a heart attack. Um, and then as the heart starts to malfunction, all the organs that rely on the heart for perfusion are now going to suffer as well. At the same time, you have a uh, very low flow of blood. And then with low flow, as I've talked about uh, during the clotting cascade lecture, you can have some of these spontaneously active uh, clotting proteins uh, activate and actually start to coagulate spontaneously. Uh, platelets can activate spontaneously. Um, it's possible, depending on what type, what the cause of the, the um, what the cause of this this was. But if let's say you have hemorrhage and you've damaged blood vessels, you could also have activated platelets there as well. And what ends up happening is they can spontaneously activate, and since the flow is low, they have more time to interact, and they could actually cause uh, lots of clotting everywhere. And that's going to be referred to something called DIC, which I have in the parentheses down there, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And what that is is just basically, you know, coagulation occurring everywhere. And uh, that can be obviously further worse in the situation because as you coagulate spontaneously, due to this sort of low flow, kind of sludgy blood, it'll start to obstruct. And if it starts to obstruct, it'll decrease venous return and only compound the situation. And so this is, as you can kind of see, sort of a, a vicious cycle uh, that ultimately can lead to death. So let me just bring your, your attention to this over here. Let me... All right, so there's this column right here. Uh, the reason I bring your attention to that is um, this is actually really important because uh, when dictating, you know, what what to kind of call the blood pressure, whether we're calling it, you know, hypertensive or so on or elevated, uh, understand that, like for example, if their blood pressure was 125 over 75, okay, well, since the systolic is elevated, all right, uh, and the blood pressure is less than uh, the diastolic is less than 80, that is considered uh, elevated blood pressure, okay. Uh, now, on the other hand, to call it stage one hypertension, systolic has to be 130 to 139, or or the diastolic has to be 80 to 89. So in other words, they could be 120. Uh, if they're 120 over 85, that's still considered stage one. So pay attention to that because we're going to come back to that later, and we'll talk more about things like hypertensive crisis and so on. So a couple of things that you guys may already know, it's, since it's in the news so much and so many people have hypertension, but some of the, the consequences of having high blood pressure uh, elevated for prolonged periods of time is that uh, it increases your risk of stroke and heart attack and atherosclerosis and heart failure and so on. Uh, some of it may seem obvious, you know, having a high afterload can cause heart failure because it puts more demand on the heart. Uh, but things like atherosclerosis can lead to heart attack and stroke because that causes damage to the endothelium and high pressures in the uh, circulatory system can damage our normal endothelium. So it loses its ability to be protective uh, and ultimately can lead to uh, stroke and heart attack. And of course, there's the associated risk of death and disability associated with all of those diseases. So it can be a very compounding problem. Some of the causes of hypertension. So this is uh, multifactorial, all right? So what we'll usually do is sort of call it either primary or secondary. Primary basically means it's what we call, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, essential hypertension, which just means we really don't know what specifically is causing the, the problem. On the other hand, secondary hypertension means uh, we can kind of pinpoint a spot and actually treat it, and in some cases actually cure high blood pressure. Um, so, for example, if it's like a tumor that's secreting lots of uh, norepinephrine into the blood, okay, that elevated levels of norepinephrine would cause it to stimulate, you know, alpha receptors on blood vessels, right, as well as stimulate the heart, increase its heart rate, and so on. By removing the tumor that was causing that, you can essentially, you know, cause, uh, cure the, their hypertension, bring them back into their normal blood pressure range. Um, and again, I said it was multifactorial, and what that really means is that the, you know, in order to control things like heart rate, stroke volume, uh, peripheral resistance, there's just so many things that go into modulating blood pressure 
things that you know go from you know moment to moment changes to chronic changes and all of the hormones and mediators uh, and uh, neural inputs that go into it that there really can be a multitude of things that can go uh, that can be an issue for a person uh, but what they're finding is that most of it really is related to the kidney because the kidney is the one that chronically regulates blood pressure so they're really kind of seeing that more and more cases are like that now what they're also seeing is that blood pressure is really it's 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 due to an increase in total peripheral resistance all right not necessarily due to an increase in cardiac output so not like chronically elevated heart rates and stroke volumes but more like increase in total peripheral resistance and kind of makes sense because the total peripheral resistance has many factors that regulate it. So therefore, um, many things that could also go wrong. Uh, last point on here is that the baroreceptors are uh, not the cause of blood pressure problems. So I know that they can regulate moment-to-moment -moment changes in blood pressure, but on the whole, they, they're, they're not the ones that are responsible for the chronic changes in blood pressure. The kidney typically is. But uh, the baroreceptors do reset at, uh, at new blood pressures over time. So to that point, the baroreceptors, I told you guys from the earlier part of this lecture, that they have a tonic level of firing. And when pressures increase, or blood pressure goes up, their rate of firing starts to increase. And what that does is that tries to counter the uh, increase in blood pressure to bring it back down again. Now, um, let's say the blood pressure is elevated for a prolonged period of time so it keeps those baroreceptors firing for longer let's say for a day or two if the blood pressure stays elevated for a day or two this, this keeps the baroreceptors firing at a very high rate for a prolonged period of time and what happens is the baroreceptors will adjust they'll adjust their firing rate and lower it back to its normal basal level of firing rate at the new higher blood pressure level so in, in effect it reset and this usually takes a day or even a day or two for that to happen. So this isn't something that's going to happen in an hour, you know, an hour of high blood pressure. This is going to take a few days. But that could be relevant um, to people whose blood pressures are going up, uh, who had normal blood pressures, uh, due to things like anxiety, uh, stress, lack of sleep, cortisol levels, and so on. Uh, if it's prolonged. Right, this can cause baroreceptors to sort of reset and change their firing. Uh, so they'll now operate at a new level. So their blood pressure may be elevated now, and now their baroreceptors will adjust to that blood pressure and maintain blood pressure around that level. Okay. The kidney. So a couple things that I want to get into about the kidney here is that uh, it's going to basically be controlling volume. It's going to be regulating input of uh, input and output of water. Okay, so the kidney gets its own perfusion, and it monitors that perfusion. It also gets signals, which we'll talk about. Like the sympathetic nervous system can speak to the kidney, well, speak to the kidney, uh, and tell the kidney to um, you know increase or decrease its uh, conservation of uh, water. So, with that, there's the one of the most common things. All right. One of the things you're going to run into a lot, and one that's heavily regulate, uh, regulated, is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or the RAS. And so, what happens is this. If I want to bring your attention down to here, so here, where we have a decrease in renal perfusion, there's something called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and what that does is that can sense a change in perfusion pressure. And in the kidney, that will release renin right here. So renin releases that into the bloodstream, so this is a hormone. Now the liver, the liver produces or makes something called angiotensinogen, which is present in our blood all the time. But it's an inactive precursor. And so it releases angiotensinogen. And when renin levels go up, that actually converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 has no real biological activity, but as angiotensin 1 accumulates and circulates, uh, it will go through the lung circulation, or the, the blood vessels of the lung, and on the endothelium in the lungs is an enzyme, ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, a very important enzyme for you guys to remember, you guys may have already heard of it. Now ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2.
angiotensin II is very biologically active and it's very, very potent. So it's a very potent vasoconstrictor. So I'll draw your attention down to here. It causes vasoconstriction. So it can actually cause vasoconstriction directly by acting on angiotensin receptors. Uh, now it can also act on the adrenal cortex over here, located superior to the, um, the kidney, and causes the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone acts on the kidney so that the cells of the kidney will actually increase their, uh, the reabsorption of sodium. As you guys recall, sodium is an osmotic agent. So when it reabsorbs sodium, water follows with it. So we can conserve water that way. So these are two things that it can do to increase blood pressure. One, it can cause vasoconstriction of the vessels themselves, increasing total peripheral resistance. And two, it can, it can uh, cause an increase in volume by activating aldosterone. And then lastly, it can also cause an increase in volume here through ADH called antidiuretic hormone, which is located in the pituitary gland. And we'll talk more to that later on, but it releases antidiuretic hormone, which acts on the kidney to reabsorb water. So this is ways in which we can increase volume, increase total peripheral resistance, uh, and thus increase blood pressure. Now, a couple of things that we will talk about more with renal is it does have a direct action on tubular reabsorption of sodium and chloride. Uh, and it's also released, renin, excuse me, is released in response to uh, increased sympathetic activity. So the sympathetic nerves can actually stimulate renin release. And again, renin is very, very potent and can be, um, and will usually be elevated in states where there's uh, low blood pressure. Now, another hypothesis with blood pressure is that um, there's uh, salts dysregulation, sodium dysregulation, I should say. Um, and they're finding some from some of the literature that some of the kidneys may not be able to regulate salt uh, as readily. And so what happens is we end up retaining more salt. And given sort of the nature of more of the Western diets with uh, lots of processed food and, and sodium intake, uh, if their kidneys don't operate uh, as efficiently as they should, you could retain that sodium and thus retain water because, again, sodium is osmotic. And so if you look at this, this sort of flow chart, which is, by the way, in your notes, it starts here. So there's uh, sodium intake that exceeds the renal capacity to excrete the salt, right? So somebody's diet, let's say, lots and lots of uh, salty foods, they retain water. The kidneys retain more salt and water because they're not as efficient at getting rid of as much of that salt and water. What that does is that's going to increase your extracellular fluid volume, right? Because sodium is primarily located in extracellular fluid. And so therefore, that's going to plump up that space there. And what that does is it does cause the release of what we call a natriuretic peptide. The Na in natriuretic stands for sodium and uretic because we're trying to, to urinate, to increase urination. So what the natriuretic peptide does, or hormone, it's released from the brain as well as from the heart, and it senses an increase in volume. That increase in volume tells the kidney to get rid of more. So if somebody's retaining a lot of salt and water, these, this hormone level would be elevated, and that would hopefully trigger the kidney to improve its ability to excrete. So down here, excrete more sodium and water. Um, and for the most part, it will do that. However, if we have chronically elevated levels of this natriuretic hormone, uh, if you look here, its other name is also called digitalis-like factor. And so it has digitalis-like action. If you guys remember digoxin, when we talked about, uh, talked about this in a few lectures ago, one of its actions is actually going to be on the smooth muscle cells. So that's this trajectory over here. You can see we're going in this direction now. So this is because of elevated levels of natriuretic peptide. So it can act on the vascular smooth muscle cells. And, and what it does is it actually inhibits the sodium potassium pump. So here's the sodium potassium pump. It can actually inhibit that. And if it inhibits the sodium potassium pump on smooth muscle cells, that causes an accumulation of sodium inside the cell. Now, mostly remember sodium is supposed to be outside in the extracellular space. But if there's more sodium inside the cell now, so we have increased sodium levels, that means this sodium which wants to go down its gradient into the cell, there's really less of a gradient now because there's a lot of sodium inside the cell. So I essentially, the sodium here doesn't have as much potential energy, uh, as much drive to get into the cell because of this loss of gradient. And if you guys remember, this is a, a secondary form of active transport. 
this is a sodium calcium exchanger. So the sodium that can't get in, this calcium then here can't get out because it's relying on sodium going down its concentration gradient to be able to move calcium outside of the cell. Um, and if you guys recall, this calcium, all right, calcium is needed for contraction. The more calcium present, the more it contracts. Uh, and that goes for all the muscles, smooth muscle, cardiac, and skeletal. So what ends up happening is this calcium stays inside the cell and increases the contractility of smooth muscle cells. And if it's increasing contractility of the smooth muscle cells that line the blood vessels, that increases their tone, which would further increase their blood pressure. So again, that would increase their total peripheral resistance, which increases their arterial blood pressure. This is also why uh, you might suggest uh, low sodium diets, right? Metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome, or otherwise known as syndrome X, or it used to formally be known as syndrome X, uh, has to do with insulin resistance. It's really one of its primary features. Is insulin resistance uh, often associated with obesity, and uh, so here's obesity, right? And hypertension and hyperlipidemia are common. Now this is different from diabetes because in diabetics, like type two diabetics, they have insulin resistance, meaning that their insulin receptors are less sensitive. So blood glucose levels start to rise because their insulin is less sensitive. Now in a diabetic, usually what happens is the pancreas, which produces the insulin, also doesn't produce enough insulin to overcome the insensitivity. So there's a lack of insulin being produced. And so therefore glucose levels can rise. Um, and then of course, you know, we can talk more about that later on. But in metabolic syndrome, there's also insulin resistance. But the difference is, the insulin is being produced by the pancreas, but now the you know as the glucose levels rise, it triggers more release of insulin from the pancreas, and so you have overall higher levels of insulin, which helps to maintain the blood sugar levels. That's why they're not diabetic because the higher levels of insulin are helping to regulate that blood sugar level. However, the high levels of uh, insulin, okay, can cause some detrimental effects. So first off, we refer to this as hyperinsulinemia it can directly increase sympathetic activity and sodium retention directly. So again, increasing sympathetic activity, increased total peripheral resistance, it increases sodium retention because it has an anti-natriuretic peptide sort of action. It does the opposite of that. So it'll retain more sodium. So that can directly cause blood pressure problems. In addition, uh, again, that'll cause some of the hypertension we see with metabolic syndrome as well as hyperlipidemia because uh, insulin's job is to store. And so it increases lipogenesis. So more fats are being produced, which means more of it wanna be processed and moved around in the blood, which means you increase your risk of atherosclerosis. And so it increases your risk factor for stroke and heart disease and so on. Treatments for hypertension. Now, I'm not going to go into any real detail here because you're going to be getting uh, a lot of this in pharmacology, but just to kind of give you sort of the logic of some of it. So a diuretic helps you to urinate, right? So you're going to reduce volume, right? Reducing volume helps to reduce venous return overall, which is going to reduce stroke volume, which reduces cardiac output which can ultimately lead to a reduction in arterial blood pressure, okay? A beta blocker. Now, a beta blocker blocks the beta receptors, right? So beta one on the heart, for example, uh, when it's stimulated, causes an increase in contractility and heart rate. So if you block it, that's gonna decrease heart rate and decrease uh, contraction. Sorry about my handwriting here that ultimately leads to a decrease in cardiac output and a decrease in blood pressure. Alpha blockers. Alpha blockers like alpha ones are located on the peripheral blood vessels and cause vasoconstriction when activated. So blocking them will decrease total peripheral resistance, which will decrease arterial blood pressure. An ACE inhibitor. So if you remember the ACE, the ACE enzyme located in the lungs, the endothelium lining the lungs, uh, activates or converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. 
uh, so we're preventing the uh, production of angiotensin 2. So if it protects, uh, if you remember what angiotensin 2 does, one thing it does is it causes vasoconstriction. So this can cause a decrease in total peripheral resistance by preventing vasoconstriction, um, which again would reduce arterial blood pressure. And then uh, at the same time, it can reduce volume Right, it can reduce volume because it's blocking the production of or the triggering of aldosterone as well as ADH, uh, which is going to reduce arterial blood pressure as well. And then finally, calcium channel blockers. Remember, we need calcium for contraction. So if I block the ability of calcium to get into the skeletal muscle, or excuse me, the smooth muscles, right, or into the heart, ultimately I can decrease contractility, which can decrease arterial blood pressure. Again, because the decrease in contractility that I put up here decreases cardiac output, which can really lead to a decrease in blood pressure. And lastly, uh, arterial distensibility. So I told you that the artery, particularly the aorta, the large artery, right, directly connected to the, um, to the left ventricle, is that the property of it is that it's distensible. Right? So with a given pressure, it distends outward as the, there's an increase in volume that's been ejected from the left ventricle. So it's distensible, it's compliant. All right? But it also is elastic, meaning it, it can recoil and recover back to its normal position. And so with that, what that means is as systolic uh, pressures increase in the ventricle and it ejects blood into the artery, uh, the artery will then distend and, and to accommodate that volume. And what that does is that actually dampens the, the pressures that can be seen downstream of the larger arteries because the smaller arteries, if their pressures were to go up very high, they could actually rupture because their walls are smaller and they're not as distensible. So it plays a protective role. By distending and dampening that, that energy that's coming from the left ventricle, it prevents downstream arteries from becoming damaged or ruptured, protecting them. So when it relaxes, or when the left ventricle relaxes, the pressures drop fairly suddenly, but the pressures in the aorta don't drop suddenly. And that's because the recoil, the elasticity of it, causes the recoil to be very slow. And so the slope of that line is very, very slow. Uh, and we've seen that on the Wigger's diagram. And so that recoil brings it back to about 80 before the next uh, ejection of blood occurs. And so what happens is that recoil, that diastolic pressure, the slowly kind of that elastic recoil, uh, the rate with which it recoils also dampens the drop in pressure. So it dampens the drop of diastolic pressure. So if, uh, say, in an elderly person, all right, who's lost some of that elasticity and lost some of that compliance in the aorta, what happens is, as the blood is ejected and fills up into the the excuse me the uh, aorta there, it doesn't distend as well, so it doesn't dampen that effect, and that can cause downstream damage to smaller blood vessels and damage their endothelium and so on. Uh, at the same time, which by the way means that the pressures also go higher because it doesn't absorb that energy, instead it's transmitted uh, further, so you can end up with a much higher systolic pressure. At the same time, this elastic recoil that occurs while the, the uh, uh, which has recoil during diast diastole, slowly back to 80. What happens is if it's lost some of that elasticity, it tends to recoil much faster and that can cause um, a further drop in blood pressure. And so what you end up having is very, you know, higher systolics and lower diastolics because you lose the dampening effect that occurs uh, by having good elastic uh, tissue. And so therefore their pulse pressure elevates. All right, so again, uh, to have that, you know, widen pulse pressure, which I have right here, you'd have an increase in diast uh, systolic and, a, you know, a decrease in your diastolic pressure would cause a widened pulse pressure. And that's really due to an increase in stroke volume. All right, if somebody's stroke volume is larger, that'll cause an increase in systolic pressures. Um, and the stiffened arteries was the example I gave for somebody who's, say, elderly, who's lost some of that elasticity, can also cause a widening. And again, that's because they can't dampen the changes in energy anymore. So we get much more abrupt changes. All right.
And that would be the end of that. And we will talk more about this in class and maybe do a quick review and answer some questions. All right. I'll see you guys soon.